Good day, everyone, and welcome to Hub International and Jackson Lewis PC's webinar, ACA, Tracking the Moving Target. Today we will discuss employer and group health plan requirements under the ever-changing health care reform rules and what will and will not change if pending legislation is enacted. Our speakers today are Monique Warren, Principal at Jackson Lewis, Dennis Fisher, Chief Compliance Officer, Northeast Region at Hub International, and Carrie Scherveni, Chief of Compliance Officer, Southeast Region at Hub International. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the Q&A window. At this point, I would like to turn the call over to Monique to start the discussion. Well, thank you, Kara. So first of all, we want to make sure that we set the stage for you just right up front because as of today, we still don't have repeal or replacement legislation that's ready for um, President Trump's signature. So we still have the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare or whatever you have chosen to call it. Um, and we have to still deal with the Affordable Care Act for as long as it survives. So we just want to you know, make sure that everybody is um, <clears throat> oriented in that direction. Um, having said that, you all know that candidate Trump and the Republicans in Congress had vowed to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act as one of their top priorities. Um, and <clears throat> the reason that it hasn't happened is uh, uh, there are quite a few interesting reasons, but they're beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about today, um, except that um, one of the main reasons is a lack of consensus on what all should be repealed and how it should be replaced. Um, so Carrie and Dennis and I are going to focus on what has happened in terms of the repeal and replacement efforts so far and um, talk about how you can stay on top of things that affect you as an employer and um, group health plan sponsor. So there are really multiple tools that are available um, for President Trump and Congress to use to re repeal and replace or just to minimize the effect of the Affordable Care Act. Um, for example, as many of you probably know, on his first day in office, President Trump issued an executive order that essentially instructed the federal agencies to do everything legally within their powers to minimize the burdens of the Affordable Care Act on um, various stakeholders. So the federal agencies that are charged with enforcing the Affordable Care Act, that's principally the Health and Human Services, uh, Department of Treasury, and the Department of Labor. These are all cabinet-level departments, and President Trump has handpicked the people leading those agencies and setting their enforcement priorities. So you can imagine where on the priority list the enforcement of the um, Affordable Care Act is, is situated for these departments, at least the provisions that the Trump administration and the Republican Congress don't like. Um, so because the only major piece of repeal and replacement legislation that's made it anywhere so far is the House Republicans' American Health Care Act. That's going to be our specific focus today. We're going to refer to it um, mostly by its acronym, the AHCA, and, and we'll refer to the Affordable Care Act as the ACA. So this is right now the most important tool in the toolbox, but – Again, bear in mind that it's still just a House-passed bill. It has not been formally considered by the Senate. Um, and it's kind of gone through a, a tortured process just to get to the point where it can be considered by the Senate. So it's expected to go through a whole lot more changes while it um, winds its way through the Senate, assuming that the Senate doesn't just start all over with its own um, its own bill. So <clears throat> the... Uh, Republicans thought that they had picked kind of the easy route for getting this bill passed through both chambers of Congress because they're using what's called the budget reconciliation process instead of the usual legislative process. Um, the budget reconciliation process enables them to avoid the possibility of a filibuster, and it also 
limits the hours of debate on um, on the bill when it gets to the Senate. So this slide really is just to give you a visual of the process that the AHCA still has to go through before it can become law and the expected time frame. Um, keep in mind that it could look a whole lot different from the way it looks today. And, um, you know, a lot of things could upset this timeline as well. So, it, you know, first up in the Senate, the bill has to pass muster as one that is purely aimed at taming the budget deficit. Otherwise, it'll have to get at least 60 votes in the Senate to pass instead of just a simple majority. And um, you might know there are only 52 Republicans in the Senate. So even if this bill is able to proceed under the Senate's budget reconciliation rules, it's still kind of skating on uh, thin ice, you might say. Okay, so um, here's kind of a preview for you of how the AHCA would alter some key provisions of the ACA that are real important to employers and group health plan sponsors. And um, Carrie's going to dive in first and go into more detail for you about the tax and credit provisions, and then Dennis is going to explain some of the other key provisions that affect employers and plans. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Carrie. Thanks, Monique. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Thanks for making the time to obtain this information and listen to us to speak with you. We're looking forward to your questions at the end. Um, I want to really focus on the taxes and credits that are proposed under the American Health Care Act. So jumping right in, most of you know and understand that under the ACA, we live under a subsidy system or a subsidy platform. And what that means is individuals may receive a subsidy based on certain criteria. And that criteria includes going out to the marketplace to purchase a plan and not receiving an offer from an employer that otherwise qualifies under the ACA. If an employee does not have an ACA compliant plan available to them by their employer and they purchase coverage under the exchange or in the marketplace, they may be eligible for a subsidy based on income, family size, and citizenship. Under the AHCA, or the American Health Care Act, the, pro the approach in the proposal is very different. The AHCA proposes a credit-based system and that credit-based system is based on age. The individual will not have to go out to the marketplace to purchase insurance. However, the rule regarding the employer offer remains the same. If the individual has a qualified group plan available to them, they will not be eligible for a credit. The plans that they purchase, whether individually on their own or through the marketplace, must also meet certain criteria and you see those criteria here on your screen. The, the credit is based on the individual's age. It's a two to one ratio for those under age 30 as compared to those age 60 and above. The credit is either going to be the maximum allowed under the statute, which you see on your screen, or the amount of the health insurance. It will be the lesser of those two. So, for example, if an individual has insurance available to them at $1,800 and the credit available to them is $2,000, they would receive a credit of $1,800 to pay for the insurance. Conversely, if the cost of an annualized insurance for somebody under age 30 is $3,000, they'll still only receive a $2,000 credit. And so these, the numbers that you see on your screen today are the maximum amount of the credit available to the individual. The credit can be paid to the individual or to the carrier, and there's a 10% reduction for $75,000 of income or more for an individual. What's interesting about the credits is it really may simplify the reporting process, and Dennis is gonna speak to you more about the new process that's proposed for reporting whether or not employers offer coverage to an individual. There will also be a new process for determining, credit, for determining credit eligibility for both individuals and for the plans. 
There are other changes that happen under the AHCA, and the first I want to talk about is the flexible spending account. Today, employees may contribute up to $2,600 to a flexible spending account. Under the AHCA, there are no limits for the contribution amount to a flexible spending account. Likewise, there are changes for health savings accounts. Today, health savings account contributions are limited to $3,400 per employee, $6,750 for family. What's really interesting to me about those limits is they're not really logically tied to any existing regulatory plan limit. For example, that doesn't connect to your deductible limit. Under the AHCA, they actually connect some dots. And the AHSA limit equals the regulatory out-of-pocket maximum for the plan. So by way of example, in 2017, the out-of-pocket maximum is $6,550 for the employee and $13,100 for the family. This would mean that an employee could contribute $3,150 more under the AHCA platform, and in a family environment, $6,350 more than they can today. Additionally, what's old is new again, and we're looking at a potential repeal of the medicine cabinet tax. Some of you may remember the days prior to ACA when you could buy your over-the-counter medications with your FSA or your HSA. The ACA hold back the ability to buy over-the-counter medications using pre-tax savings dollars. We called it the medicine cabinet tax, and the American Health Care Act proposes to eliminate the medicine cabinet tax, which means you can use your FSA or your HSA or your HRA or other tax savings dollars to purchase over-the-counter medications. What this really means, guys, in a nutshell, is that you've got increased spending ability for your pre-tax savings dollars and increase savings ability, eliminating or increasing limits and caps of the amount of money that you can put aside in a pre-tax environment. Additionally, I want to speak about the Cadillac tax. And I know that this is a very controversial and, and um, most hated, <laughs> based on my clients' feedback, tax that exists inside of the ACA. Unfortunately, I, I don't have particularly great news to share with you. The Cadillac tax does not go away but it is delayed until 2026. Now, a lot of people often ask me, you know, what is the Cadillac tax? I don't understand. How do you calculate it? What does it mean? So I'm going to do my best to give you a brief overview of the Cadillac tax today. The Cadillac tax is a 40% excise tax on the excess benefits of plans that reach certain thresholds. So what are those thresholds and what do they mean? Under the Cadillac tax, If a plan costs $10,200 for single or $27,500 for other than single coverage, it may be subject to the Cadillac tax. Notably, that $27,500 is on other than single coverage, which could meet employee plus child or employee plus family. The tax is imposed on plan costs that exceed those thresholds. So, for example, If an employee-only coverage total cost is $12,000, the tax is on $1,800, which is that difference between the $10,200 threshold and the $12,000 cost for the plan. So what does cost for the plan mean? Cost for the plan means the total health insurance premium billed to or charged to the employer, employee plus employer total cost. I call it the bill rate. You pull out your health insurance bill, it's the amount billed on there. It also includes other related plan costs like HSAs, HRAs, FSAs, and group wellness as an example. There are other programs that are also included in that calculation toward the threshold to determine whether or not the Cadillac tax applies. So why are we making a big deal about or talking about a tax that may not take place until 2020 or 2026? It's really important, guys, that you're planning now and you're planning today for what may happen in three or five years. HUB, in particular, works really closely with its employers and its client companies to build three- to five-year strategic plans 
so that clients don't wake up in 2019 or if AHCA passes in 2024 with the stark realization that they better double their deductibles and double co-payments to bring down the plan costs so that they don't reach that Cadillac tax. So it's important to strategize well in advance of the imposition of the Cadillac tax so you're not faced with pulling the rug out under your employees by increasing plan costs to avoid premium, premium increases. Additionally, it's really interesting to me to take a look at all of the other taxes that were created or increased by the ACA. And so the next two slides, we give a very brief overview of some of those taxes created or increased by the ACA and under the AHCA may be repealed or reduced. Notably, the individual ability to deduct health insurance expenses is actually expanded under AHCA, and that threshold is reduced from 10% to 5.8%. Likewise, the PCOR fee is sun is, would be slated to sunset earlier in 2018, and the all-important, highly controversial tanning bed tax would be repealed under the AHCA. So that's really a brief overview of some of the tax implications associated with the potential impact of AHCA. I'm going to turn the program over to Dennis now, who's going to dig deeper into some of the other provisions associated with ACA and the changes proposed by AHCA. Dennis? Thank you, Carrie. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dennis Fisher. Thank you for joining today. <clears throat> I'll open my discussion by circling back to Monique's comments about the civics lessons behind the Republican AHCA proposal. The fact that Republicans don't hold a Senate supermajority constrains their ability to rewrite ACA exactly as they might wish. Instead, they're forced to use the uh, simple majority approach, and that's limited to changes that are tied to budget and revenue processes. So we're left with an inelegant result. Uh, using the simple majority process is a little bit like trying to use scissors while wearing a baseball glove. It's something that's possible to do, but the results aren't always going to be pretty. And, and this is why uh, we, instead of simply removing the employer and individual mandates from the law, and, and it's a question I'm constantly asked, why don't Republicans just eliminate the ACA? Well, they just can't, not with the options that are currently at their disposal. And that's why we see the weird result of the employer mandate staying in place as part of the law, but the penalty risk changed from the $2,000 and $3,000 levels down to a $0 level. Basically, nullifying the dollar penalty eviscerates the ACA mandates. And that's why in this political cartoon, a depiction of the traffic light camera staying in place, taking photographs of violations all day long, but not having any real impact since the drivers would be getting tickets at $0 penalties. I'd also note that AHCA, the proposal, would change the mandate penalties to $0 retroactive to January 1st, 2016. Why is that important? Because, as I'm sure most employers well remember, the first phase of the mandate started in 2015. And a correction that only dates to January 1, 2016, leaves an open question about how mandate violations from 2016 are going to be handled. I don't think that there's a direct answer right now, and maybe this was just an innocent drafting oversight. Or it could be something more sinister that sets the government uh, up for uh, the ability to capture some revenue down the road. In any event, it's an issue that uh, we will be watching. So now let's allow uh, the possibility of dumping the mandate penalties to sink in a little bit. If the employer mandate goes away, then there's really no stick requiring health coverage from large employers. More importantly, though, some of the problematic ACA elements instantly uh, they recede to the background. In particular, the ability to define eligible employees returns to employer discretion. Employers would be liberated from using measurement period rules. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, the ability to unilaterally establish costs for employee coverage would be reinstated. So headaches associated with monitoring contribution affordability using the 9.5% uh, standard, those would also be lifted. And measuring applicable large employer side has been especially tough. 
Those complicated rules require a comprehensive count of all full-time persons enterprise-wide, including any control group members, plus adding in the aggregate number of full-time equivalents uh, based on combining part-time worker hours. So it's very complicated stuff. I've also spoken to employers that struggled because they were on the bubble of 50 uh, full-time employees, and they may be crossing over into ACA and becoming subject uh, one year and then shrinking the following year in a manner that uh, affects their ongoing ACA compliance. So taking the employer mandate away, zeroing the dollar penalties out, uh, in essence is a little bit of a back to the future here so that the EB world of tomorrow would look much like it stood in uh, 2010. Here are some uh, more details and considerations that surface if AHCA is enacted and the uh, mandates are, are dumped. The ACA definition of full-time employee at 30 hours per week, 130 hours per month, uh, would be ended. So employers with variable hour workers, those are people that work unpredictable hours. Uh, they'd no longer have to use, the employer would no longer have to use the very rigid counting hours rules associated with variable employment. And suddenly, the look-back periods and the corresponding stability periods, those uh, rules would be lifted. Uh, in addition, the hyper-technical rules associated with processing changes in status, those events that might surface during someone's stability period, those would go away. Uh, another biggie is that employers would be relieved of having to show that they reached 95% of their full-time employees with a compliant offer. That 95% rule was tricky, and it required employers to really keep an eye on the ball because <clears throat> messing up could trigger the massive sledgehammer penalty. So especially for employers that might be using independent contractors or that had large numbers of variable hour employees that made it tough to identify the full-time staff, hitting that 95% could be a very challenging proposition. So a natural question is, would removing the mandate instantly result in a reduction of health insurance offerings? Uh, that's an interesting question, and I think that there's a lot going on here. Uh, you, you may not see that reduction. For example, I'm speaking to you from New York uh, City, the New York City area, where there are many restaurant employers, and they responded to ACA by launching bare-bone plans with the intent of neutralizing the uh, ACA's big sledgehammer penalty uh, using what's sometimes called a mech strategy. Now, because those programs don't come with a big price tag, and many were integrated with voluntary benefit offerings that are 100% employee pay all, it seems likely that we would continue to see those programs survive any HCA enactment, especially since they're low cost, they're already in place, and the administrative work required to maybe dismantle such programs might not be worth the effort. Also for employers with insured plans, some carriers may need to refile policies with the state departments of insurance, get approval, and you can imagine that <clears throat> carriers won't be in a hurry if that means cutting their revenue by reducing enrollments. So even with AHCA enactment, it could be strategic for some insurance carriers to <clears throat> drag their feet a little bit at least in some cases. And then what about the question of affordability? If Republicans can pass AHCA, the ACA requirement for eva uh, affordability evaporates. The question there is, would this immediately result in employers suddenly cost shifting against employees? It's another possibility, but it's probably less likely to happen than you know, we might think, especially for larger employers as they continue to face the need to attract and retain uh, worker talent. Uh, many would seem disinclined to uh, take away benefits or cost shift against the employee, even if ACA, uh, the, the mandate is taken off the table. Now, having said that, it's possible that we could see a resurfacing of group health plans containing new eligibility restrictions and, and class outs. Of course, some plans are subject to discrimination testing, and that uh, precludes some of those distinctions and puts handcuffs on what can be done. But in the insurance context, where you may not be subject to testing, uh, those kinds of distinctions could be uh, viable. Next, we look at HCA's requirement for continuous coverage. 
A big question mark in the debate about possible ACA repairs is how pre-existing condition exclusions might be impacted. President Trump has specifically noted that pre-existing conditions would remain eliminated in any post-ACA world. However, if the individual mandate to hold coverage goes away, if that's zeroed out, and simultaneously there's no pre-existing exclusion rule, then many ex uh, experts would say that some significant percentage of the population uh, would likely avoid paying for health coverage as long as they could and simply wait on the sidelines and they get sick before they uh, would want to buy anything. Sometimes we call that opportunistic health coverage purchasing. So under AHCA, Republicans would rely on a continuous coverage requirement to help protect the health insurance market. Specifically, when it comes to marketplace operations, Republicans would protect the market in a couple of ways. First, the open enrollment window in which uh, they could, a person could purchase health coverage, that would be dramatically shortened. And instead of the three months as originally established under ACA, the enrollment period is now just six weeks. And more importantly, if someone allows coverage to lapse for more than 63 days and then seeks to buy health coverage at the next open enrollment, they could be saddled with a surcharge amount. Uh, the appropriate surcharge level is kind of a debated topic, but in the AHCA proposal, the surcharge is set at 30% for a 12-month period. Not forever, just for that 12 months. So that means that if a person chooses to stay on the sidelines but then gets seriously ill, they would be permitted to buy their health coverage without a pre-existing condition exclusion, but they'd pay a surcharge on their premium for 12 months if they fail to hold continuous coverage. This is a very controversial point, and I've, I talked to a lot of employers about this, because without question, a person who's allowed coverage to lapse would be paying more for the same type of health coverage, and on some level, that seems unfair. But the flip side is the reality of how insurance is supposed to work and market vitality is at risk if there's no mechanism to maximize participation for everyone in a national risk pool. And by the way, I'm sure many of you will remember the 63-day lapse in coverage rule because it wasn't that long ago that we had the HIPAA certificates of coverage uh, that functioned as part of the HIPAA portability protections. And back in those days, Pre-existing condition exclusions were permitted, but generally they were limited to a maximum of 18 months, and then they could be reduced with evidence of prior coverage that would be reflected on a HIPAA certificate. And it wouldn't surprise me if we see a resurrection of a HIPAA-style certificate of coverage if the AHCA proposal is enacted. Now, this is a big slide. Um, how would a Republican enactment of AHCA affect employer reporting? I'm describing these relatively new Form 1094, 1095 requirements. In my experience, the reporting is probably the most unpopular element of ACA, at least from an employer perspective. Uh, the forms are horrible. Uh, they're loaded with complicated coding and all sorts of detail. I know that they took hours to complete, and even if you could uh, successfully outsource the work, it was often expensive and it had other problems you know, transferring data and those sorts of things. Uh, unfortunately, if AHCA passes, it does appear that reporting is going to linger. Why would that be necessary? Why, why, would, it be, uh, why would an employer have to do any reporting if neither the employer uh, or the individual faced any liability because AHCA would zero out the penalties? And uh, my great colleague, uh, Carrie, already touched a little bit about this, but because of the federal commitment to operating the exchanges and that remains in place, federal assistance to funds for health coverage obtained through an exchange remains conditioned on whether the person received an offer of coverage from his or her employer. So there has to be some evidence of that offer memorialized somewhere. So reporting to the government is going to remain necessary, at least for the immediate future. Um, at the same time, I think we can confidently say that reporting should get easier because the forms could be streamlined to focus more on information that the government needs to process a health coverage application. And on a positive note, at the bottom of this slide, we highlight the possibility that the Form 1095 could be retired and instead replaced by a newly expanded Form W-2. 
the new uh, Form W-2 might take the place of the Form 1095 and carry information that verifies whether the individual received a health cover, uh, coverage offer from his or her employer. And uh, certainly that should make the uh, world a lot uh, easier. Another controversial element among Republicans about AHCA relates to how reform burdens would affect the states. As proposed, AHCA would accommodate state waivers to opt out of federally defined standards. So states would have to apply for a waiver from Congress. The waiver process would be conditioned on some pretty rigorous standards. Uh, specifically, the state would have to show how their approach would, would result in uh, lower premiums. The state would have to show how their proposed approach would uh, boost market stability and enrich coverage choices for consumers. Uh, we already see some states like California and Massachusetts proactively moving forward with programs of their own. If the Republicans successfully enact AHCA, some states, uh, particularly those that the media uh, calls the blue states, they could be spurred into devising uh, local solutions. If that were to happen, you could see a variety of different styles influence marketplaces around the country. States could adapt solutions that implement different definitions of essential health benefits and uh, premium ratios that vary more widely than the 5 to 1 established at the federal level. Also, as we just discussed when we talked about continuous coverage obligations, those could look very different inside states that might successfully obtain waivers. Uh, such states might incorporate mechanisms apart from the 63-day coverage uh, lapse to protect their local markets. So on a practical basis, what might waivers mean for employers? I think that's a big question. Uh, it could become more challenging for multi-state employers, national employers to operate. We might see a fragmentation of compliance burdens in a manner that employers have historically been shielded from under ERISA. For decades, a fundamental feature of ERISA was that states were restricted from directing employers about health coverage matters except for what might be indirectly regulated through an insurance carrier when the employer bought a group health policy, and this, this was called preemption. This is a little like buying a suit off the rack. Once the employer buys a policy, it agrees to conform to those rules that were already contained and imprinted on the policy, and the, the policy is defined by the state. Now, with congressional waivers, we could see a broader power to direct employers about EB than was originally envisioned under ERISA. And this is uh, obviously an important issue for uh, employers and one that we're carefully monitoring. Now we reach our first uh, polling question. Uh, the question centers on ACA reporting and the uh, forms 1094-1095. I know that many employers I've talked to a lot that have been contacted by the states and HHS with notifications that some employees, part of their population, that they've obtained health coverage from an exchange. This is different. Uh, this relates to IRS activities. And on this slide, uh, we show in a de-identified way, obviously, one such letter that was delivered in the New York area uh, to inquire about a missing report from an employer uh, through the EIN number. Uh, the IRS believed that this was an ALE that should have submitted a 1094. So the question to our audience uh, would be, A, are you aware that the IRS has been issuing ALE letters? Or B, have you received an IRS inquiry about ACA reporting? Or C, are you unaware of the IRS ALE rep uh, reporting inquiries? Uh. We'll wait about 20 seconds to uh, calculate those responses. To my knowledge, only a handful of letters have gone out, so I would suspect that C would be the popular choice. But uh, the survey says, uh-huh. So, okay, not surprisingly, these uh, letters are still somewhat rare. I think employers should recognize that the IRS has already compiled a substantial amount of information in the reporting 
that it did succeed, uh, succeed in collecting in the last couple of years. And we'll have to stay tuned to see how the IRS plans to use that compiled information going forward. And also, while the IRS has promised some pretty broad forgiveness for reporting errors in the opening phases of the 1094-1095 uh, processing, it's eye-opening that the IRS maintains some interest in exploring reporting and vetting out the information that it's collected to date. And that's why this, this letter is so uh, critical and, and it was concerning. Um, if you, uh, as an employer, receive any similar such letter, we'd encourage you to immediately reach out to your uh, hub advisor for help. With that, let's switch gears, and I'll turn things back over to Monique. Thank you, everyone. So let's take a look first at some of the ACA provisions that would survive, assuming the AHCA is enacted in its uh, in its current form, um, remembering that it has to wind its way through the um, through the Senate. So um, and all the things that can happen to it there. So um, on this slide, you you kind of see we we'd still have the federal and state marketplaces where individuals and small groups can buy health coverage. Um, We'd still have uh, insurers unable to deny coverage based, based on a health condition or to impose the um, pre-existing condition limits or exclusions. But remember that, uh, as Dennis told us, the waiver states could allow insurers to impose higher premiums than um, that are health condition-based, if you will, um, on in, in individuals who have had a lapse in coverage that's more than 63 days. So. Um, you see here we'd also still have age-rated premiums if the AHCA is enacted, but as Dennis said, the ratio would increase um, from 3 to 1 to 5 to 1. And um, finally, insurers would still be required to make the medical loss ratio reimbursement payments, and you'd still have the federal government sort of providing this um, assistance to uh, insurers for high-risk policyholders. So some other things that about the ACA, again, that you become familiar with that would still be with us under the AHCA, um, the ACA's rules that prohibit cost sharing for preventive services um, and the rules that require dependent coverage to continue for children up to age 26 would survive. We'd still have the external review and appeal requirements and the rules that prohibit uh, provider discrimination. We'd still have the limits on out-of-pocket maximums and the codified or yeah codified wellness program incentive limits, um, going um, from 30 up to 50 percent for tobacco-based programs. So. Um, remember, too, that the, the AHCA would nullify, in effect, the pay-or-play penalties as well as the individual mandate penalty, but we still have these penalties for now. <laughs> so um, just a reminder about how those penalties work. Um, in order to avoid penalties, you have to make sure, if you're an applicable large employer, you have to make sure that at least 95% of your full-time employees and their kids to age 26 are offered coverage. And for your full-time employees, that means coverage that's at least minimum value and affordable. So for 2017, affordable means that the employee's cost for self-only coverage can't exceed 9.69% of household income, and you have still the, um, the three safe harbor methods for determining whether that affordability threshold is actually met. So we have um, a, another polling question, and then I think we're going to have some time to take some of your questions. Um, the polling question is, we're interested in knowing um, 
what your plans, what as an employer and group health plan sponsor, what your intentions are. Um, how many of you plan to make changes to your benefit strategies based on what you know about the AHCA as it currently stands? Um, maybe especially in light of the fact that the play or pay penalties are expected to go away. And how many of you expect to reduce benefits, keep benefits the same, increase them? Um, and you know, how many of you expect to change the employer contribution, for example, um, or how many of you just don't intend to make any change until you have more information or can be sure that the penalties would be eliminated. So um, we'll give a few minutes, or a few seconds here anyway, for some um, time for you to respond. And I think this time we'll give quite a bit more time. Since you have so many choices. I think my friends at Hub and at Jackson Lewis, we've all been talking to clients about some of their options here. And of course, none of us have a crystal ball, but some employers are making some uh, plans to make changes. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what we have. Um, it looks like so most of you are um, just going to stay the course and that's, in, in my experience, that's been primarily what um, our employer clients are, are doing as well, and I assume that's the same um, for you folks as well, Carrie and Dennis, and what your, um, your clients are, are telling you. So, um, and, and part of that is it's just there are too many unknowns. Um, and that's, we'll leave you with this um, before we go on to questions, leave you with this slide. You've seen this before earlier in the presentation. It's a reminder of all of the uncertainties <laughs> for the American Health Care Act, the AHCA um, itself. And, you know, it has a lot of, of steps to go through still. And um, the you have to bear in mind that the AHCA is just... Uh, it's the bill that has made it the furthest, I guess, and provides the most comprehensive um, Republican solution for repeal and replacement, but it's not the only tool in the toolbox, um, so keep that in mind. Um, and I think we will have some time to answer some of the, the individual questions. We've had a lot of questions that have come in. So I will turn it back to Kara to Hi, everyone. So uh, we did get lots of questions. Um, and let's see, Dennis, it looks like this first question is for you. If I'm an employer organization that should have sent in its Form 1094, 1095, but never did, what options do I have now? Is it still required, or should I wait to be contacted? Is my company facing any risk by not filing? I think Dennis may be on mute here. Ah, yes, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, that that's uh, that is a question that kind of goes to uh, the heart of what we described in the uh, polling. Um, that the reporting is an obligation that's currently in effect. Nothing has changed. ACA uh, remains the law of the land. Certainly, there's all sorts of uh, expectation that Republicans 
are going to end up doing something, but it's not uh, anything that you can uh, really bank on. Um, my suggestion is the technical uh, answer is that you you'd go ahead and, and take care of it now. Uh, do the uh, do the reporting and fulfill that uh, requirement. I think that uh, even though when they when the IRS said that they were going to be willing to overlook and uh, work with employers that uh, showed good faith efforts, they specifically said that lateness was not going to be forgiven. Um, but there are some things in the employer's favor. I think that you have a, a new administration that uh, you know may not uh, fund resources to do the enforcement at the same level that a different administration might have pursued. So uh, I say that you would do the reporting, uh, even if it's late, and uh, you know at least that would that would stop the uh, bleeding potentially uh, on a bigger problem that would surface if you didn't do anything. And uh, meanwhile, you can hope that if the Republicans do succeed, and there is still a long legislative process ahead, and, uh, and Monique kind of wrapped up with that uh, timeline, uh, there might be some salvation. If, if this were to uh, transpire, then you'd have the penalties go away. And uh, the one area you might be looking at would be in 2015, which I referenced in my section is the kind of uh, open area of what's going to happen with violations that occurred in 2015. So uh, I hope that that gives a little bit of uh, framework for what an answer should be, but uh, and I, I think it's important to, to, finish, to do the reporting. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Carrie, we've got a question uh, here for you. What should we do with our SPD if the HCA becomes law? So that's a great question. Um, I, I always explain to clients that the SPD or the summary plan description operates like the SOP of the plan. So for those of you who have operational policies and procedures, standing operating processes, procedures, SOPs, whatever, whatever your organization may call them, the SPD operates like the SOP for the health insurance plan. It lays out the rules and the processes that apply to the plan, regardless of what the law says. And what I mean by that is, if ACA is no longer the law of the land and things like eligibility and coverage offerings change, you're still obligated to follow whatever is set forth in your SPD. So it's really important that that SPD remain current with the law or you could find yourself in a very difficult position with a plan document that doesn't comport with the law, um, but plan operations that are caught in the middle of the struggle. So I recommend that if AHCA is passed, that that employers speak with their broker or their service provider or whoever it may be um, that handles their summary plan description. It's also re important to remember that SPDs are required for all ERISA plans regardless of employer size, whether you have five people, 50 people, 500 people, or 5,000 people. And, and, you know, if um, I could chime in, too, I was just thinking that, uh, the SPD might be just one place that you'd look at, and uh, there are other areas of documentation that would need attention as well. And uh, things like stop-loss contracts, uh, typically they follow the eligibility provisions, but if uh, the law changes, then uh, it would be important to revisit that and ensure that everything uh, uh, corresponds and flows in a cohesive manner. Um, so it's it's the SPD is a great starting point, but enrollment forms, communication materials, um, other uh, types of agreement, agreements that are in place are going to be important uh, considerations and, and making sure that uh, uh, materials are updated and, and documentation is correct. And and it's I'll just add on to that too, since um, you know we're talking about other documentation. Um, it's a little bit more mundane to think about, but your vendor contracts, you know, how do, how will your agreements um, with vendors potentially change in terms of the services that the vendors provide for you? Um, so you really have to kind of think about all of the um, different ways that your, the, the plan, the documents that govern the, um, not just the benefits that are promised, 
and how they're delivered, but you know also um, administrative type documentation. Yeah, that that is such a great point because as you face potential changes from ACA to HCA, we all wish that they had come up with a better acronym. We understand that this is all kind of crazy confusing. Um, but as you start to think about changes in eligibility and calculations associated with effective dates and plan eligibility, you have to look to your to your software providers because so many of us rely on our software providers to automate the tracking and the reporting associated with ACA compliance. And so as AHCA changes, our technology vendors and vendor partners are going to be faced with another scramble like we saw several years ago in trying to re-engineer their systems and re-engineer the coding behind them to keep up with changes in the law. Um, and so while we're all excited about the potential change with respect to the complexities we face today, um, it's, it's not going to necessarily be a smooth or easy transition to pull back some of these regulations. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's do one last question. And actually, Monique, this question is for you. Uh, what do you think the, are the odds that the IRS will never impose any play or pay penalties? Oh, the crystal ball question. <laughs> um, so I think that, um, you know, while the we're, we're told we're never supposed to speculate and um, encourage uh, employers to kind of roll the dice and um, uh, gamble on whether a particular compliance requirement is going to be enforced. But, um, you know, we do know that we have an um, administration and a Congress in place right now, a majority in Congress, who um, really uh, the, uh, tend to agree that the, um, the penalties should not be um, enforced. So I think there's a good chance, but I think that it's a um, it, it's a it's a gamble that um, most employers don't want to take. Um, so you know there's there's a great possibility <laughs> that they, there won't be enforcement. But I think as as Dennis pointed out, there's sort of a a gap as well in even in the AHCA. Um, you know, nullifying the amount of the penalties back to January 1, 2016, um, uh, you know, leaves open the possibility of um, enforcement um, of, a, you know, of those penalties, assessing the penalties for other periods. So, uh, and I just, I saw another, if we have just a minute, um, do we have time for one more? We do. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, a question came up of, of how the an employer is supposed to know what family income is, and I think that that went to the um, affordability question, and you know how to determine whether a premium costs more than 9.69 percent for 2017. Um, but bear in mind that. Um, you have those three safe harbors and uh, three safe harbor ways for determining what uh, whether a particular premium for self-only coverage is um, affordable. So I don't know if there's a way to go back to that slide, but um, we do have a slide in the deck that, that points that out. Thanks, Monique. Um, I think that that is pretty much all the time we're going to have today. For those of you who asked questions during the webinar that weren't answered, we're going to collect those and get back to you with responses via email. And you're also going to all receive an email with a recording of the webinar. So I'd like to thank you all for attending ACA Tracking the Moving Target, and this concludes our discussion for the day.